gone on today, some of them intentionally, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, this is an important enough issue that we, we hear a, have a full and fair hearing here, and we intend to do just that. Uh, I know there were some witnesses who have offered testimony in writing and will accept that without objection. Uh, but in continuous of our hearing, I want to introduce our next panel. Ambassador Michael Guest served as America's first openly gay Senate-confirmed U.S. Ambassador during his tenure as Ambassador to Romania uh, from 2001 to 2004. Uh, Mr. Guest currently serves as Senior Advisor to the Council for Global Equality, which was formed in September 2008 by a coalition of human rights organizations that advocate for a stronger and more consistent U.S. government and corporate voice on behalf of lesbian, gay, uh, and transgender human rights protections at home and abroad. And uh, I know you've changed your seating here, so I'm, I'm going to try to. My partner had sacrificed his career to support me in serving the country that we both love, and in return was treated as a second-class citizen in our overseas postings. And I couldn't reconcile how an administration so consumed with the fight against terrorism would knowingly put my partner's life at risk, and indeed put the security and effectiveness of our embassy communities at risk through policies that base protections needlessly on marriage, an option that, of course, is unavailable to us. Mr. Chairman, the State Department's specific inequalities that I challenged have framed my perspective, and those are offered in detail in my written testimony. As examples, the Department would not train my partner in how to recognize a terrorist threat or a counterintelligence trap, thus putting his life and, indeed, U.S. interest at risk. He had no guarantee of being evacuated, whether for life-threatening medical reasons or to escape political violence that might close an embassy. The Department would not train him in the informal community leadership roles that he, as my partner, was in fact expected to fill. Unlike spouses, he had no diplomatic protections, nor could he compete for jobs that the embassy needed to fill regardless of his qualifications. And while the Department paid to transport pets to and from post, it wouldn't pay my partner's airfare as if the government for which he sacrificed so much personally considered him to be less important than a dog. Now I trust you can see the ironies. As a diplomat, I advanced American principles of equality, fair play, and respect for diversity in the countries to which I was posted, and yet the very agency that charged me to represent those policies showed no respect for those principles in how it treated those of us who are gay or lesbian nor did that agency which drills crisis management, diversity awareness, and leadership skills into all employees show any concern at all on the issues of health, safety, morale, and effectiveness that stem from these discriminatory policies. Now, Mr. Chairman, I still believe that America is the greatest country on Earth, and I'm proud of the time that I spent in the State Department, but my experience in seeking redress of these inequalities made me realize that this is not the America I believed in when I came to Washington some 30 years ago to work, in fact, as an intern here on Capitol Hill. You see, the issue we are here to address is not about personal belief, and it's not the definition of marriage. Those are red herrings. It's workplace fairness, and it's civil rights. Somehow, we as a country have allowed the term equality, which is an absolute term, to be redefined to mean more rights for some individuals and fewer for others. LGBT Americans are not demanding so-called special rights, as some claim through this or any other bill. How is it that we're debating, even today, whether citizens who are gay should enjoy the same fundamental protections as others that we work with, who live in our communities, work in offices and factories, and yes, share fellowship in our places of worship? And in that regard, I want to mention that when I was a student at Furman University many years ago, I attended First Baptist Church in Taylor, South Carolina, which is represented here by my fellow panelists. Mr. Chairman, I was reluctant to relive before, my, before this committee the most painful chapter of my life, uh, the decision to leave a career that I love. But for me, this is a matter of closure. When President Obama took his action on the 17th of, this, of last month, uh, to redress the issues at the State Department. I took my partner's hand and quietly apologized to him that this action couldn't have come sooner for his sake. And now the spotlight is on Congress. The bill before you addresses a range of benefits that remain out of reach for federal employees with same-sex partners. These have been detailed by other panelists. 
They are as critical to our families as they are to yours, and I respectfully ask that you close this gap. You've heard many solid arguments for this bill based on things like worker retention and budgetary impact and comparisons to corporate policies, but I ask you to support this legislation for different reasons. First, principle is at stake. Equality, fair-mindedness, and respect for diversity are at the heart of America's identity. This bill would honor those principles and bring us closer to fulfilling those ideals. But second, this bill is about people. Those of us who are gay have the same aspirations, the same hopes, and the same needs as any of you. We have families that we love, that we need to take care of just as you do. We are humans like you. We love and support our country like you do. And we ask only to be treated fairly and equally and that our pr families be provided with the same protections and benefits that are provided to yours. I've been in Washington almost three decades, and I've heard over and over that policy issues related to uh, gay and lesbian Americans are just too hard to tackle, and that other agendas must come first, and that the time is not now. I believe the time is now. This issue is hard only because we make it so, and surely we can come together as a country and as a people to do the right thing for families who've yet to recognize and realize the equality to which we as citizens are entitled. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ambassador. Ms. Holmes, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good evening, Chairman Lynch. Would you move that mic? Because go. after all this time, I want to hear every word you have to say. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Lynch. I appreciate this opportunity to testify before you in favor of domestic partner benefits for federal employees. I appreciate that my partner and a portion of my family are also present. It's been a long time since I have visited the Rayburn Building, where my father worked years ago as a laborer serving in these same hearing rooms. He would take me by the hand and walk me through these very halls of Congress, explaining this is where decisions are made, Candy, that impact us all. I would have never imagined I would return to be speaking before you today before you now on a topic of such importance to me and to countless others. I believe my father is looking upon us from celestial heights, proud that I am here. Thank you for convening this hearing. My name is Candy Holmes, and I am a federal employee, a manager with the Government Accountability Office in Washington, DC. I have worked at the GAO for 33 years, absolutely 33 years. I am here to speak not only about my story, but to express my views on the merits and the need for this legislation that ensures that lesbian and gay federal employees and our same gender partners receive the same benefits that are granted to our opposite gender, married federal employees. I am not here speaking as a representative of the GAO. I am testifying on my own behalf. It is also important for me to share with you that I am lesbian and I am Christian. And for the last 20 years, I have been a part of the Metropolitan Community Churches, and I am an ordained clergywoman. I am in a same gender relationship with the Reverend Darlene Garner. We are in a loving, committed relationship in which we worry about our children, take pride in our grand and great-grandchildren, make a home together, and plan our retirement together. Darlene is also ordained clergy with the MCC and serves as part of the denomination spiritual leadership. Because she is an employee of the MCC, she relies on limited employee benefits and a retirement plan that will provide less than $120 a month when she retires. There are many families like ours. The difference is this. The government to which I have devoted 33 years of my working life will not honor my partnership because I love another woman, not a man. There are many voices and stories you will not have a chance to hear, so I share from our collective experiences of unfair treatment and unjust federal policies. I entered the federal government in 1977. That day, and in that day, it was enough that I was also dealing with the dynamics of being African American and a woman in the federal workplace. So I was a closeted lesbian. I worked in utter fear that I would be found out and suffer the consequences. 
Like many others, I chose to be silent, and that rendered my life invisible. Recently, I came to a tipping point in my life. The decision in California to uphold Proposition 8, the ban on gay marriage, sent me a stark, clear, yet unbelievable message. Discrimination can be legalized again. I was outraged, so I am here to bear witness openly as a lesbian federal employee who seeks fair and equal treatment. Federal employees who are married to someone of the opposite gender are automatic beneficiaries of federal benefits. My family and others like us are automatically denied. It is disturbing, demoralizing, to be treated as a second-class citizen and worker and told that I cannot enjoy the benefits of my labor on an equal footing with my opposite gender counterparts. Being treated as a second-class citizen is eerily familiar to me. Same church, just a different pew. There was a time in this country when being treated differently because of the color of my skin was simply the way it was. Being treated so unfairly now because of whom I love is more than a matter of fairness. It is an issue of civil rights. My partner and I are preparing for our retirement years now. Unless this act is adopted now, the economic impact of my retirement on my family will be dire, as though I had never dedicated 35 years of my life to my career as a federal employee. No opposite gender married couple will ever, ever have to think about this, ever have to even think about such a thing because they had been privileged by right of legislation. Government should work for us, not against us. In summary, Chairman Lynch, the family benefits in question are a significant portion of employee compensation. Because gay and lesbian federal employees do not receive equal pay for our equal contributions, it is clear that this act would be a first step in the right direction toward eliminating discrimination in compensation. As I conclude, I would like to thank the co-sponsors from both the House and the Senate for their ongoing efforts to move this act to this point and for linking their hands with mine and others on the arc of history to bend it once more towards justice. During these days of uncertainty, I remind us all of the words of President Obama from his inaugural address. The time has come to reaffirm our enduring spirit, to choose our better history, to carry forward that precious gift, that noble idea passed on from generation to generation, the God-given promise that all are equal, all are free, and all deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness, including federal employees like me. There is no wrong time to do the right thing. Thank you and God bless. Chairman Lynch, I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Dr. Page, we are thankful that you uh, had such patience as well to stay uh, and to offer your testimony. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate the opportunity to address uh, this committee, though singular you are at this particular moment. I have heard uh, much talk today in the six hours plus that I have sat here about diversity, about equality, about fairness. But I have to note for the record, in the interest of fairness, I am the only person asked to speak as a witness today who speaks in opposition to this proposed bill, H.R. 2517. I have heard a great deal of uh, verbiage today about how this would make the government uh, on equal footing uh, regarding recruitment and retention. I have heard many things about fairness, and I understand that, and I hear that in my heart. But I do believe this is a part of a social agenda. And I do speak in opposition to H.R. 2517. 
primarily because of two reasons. One is moral, one is financial. I do believe that it has been the perennial role of the government to support the institutions of society such as marriage. And in this instance, I think this is taking a direct role in opposition to a traditional definition and support of that which marriage has traditionally been. I believe that the government has always stood to support, not to discourage. I do believe in moral absolutes. Those are words we've not heard today. Those are words that are not popular in our culture today. But I do say that I do believe there are moral absolutes. I was excited to hear Ambassador Guest say that he had attended our church. I would love for him to attend again. And he would find a place of love and welcome. But he would also hear again biblical truth that marriage is one man, one woman, freely and totally committed to each other as companions for life. We believe that the government ought to support the role of marriage in our society. We also, as unpopular as it is today, believe that this is a part of a social agenda that continues to seek normalization of a homosexual lifestyle that I, and I believe many other evangelicals, not all, certainly oppose. We care for people, we do love people, but we're painted as if we are hateful, caricatured as mean-spirited, we're not. But we do believe there are absolutes and we stand by them. This bill promises equal treatment, but I believe that it has created an elitism. For example, it's been pointed out today that heterosexual couples, opposite gender couples, would not be allowed to have the same benefits. It's been pointed out, well, they can get married. Well, there are same-sex couples that do not wish to get married. There are opposite-sex couples that do not wish to get married for many reasons. This sets aside same-sex couples as an elite class, and those same benefits would be denied to opposite-sex couples who choose not to marry. So I do believe that this is creating a discriminating, it is a discriminating bill. And again, I think that is improper. Do I personally oppose same-sex couples who live together without marriage? Yes. Do I oppose opposite-sex couples who live together? Yes, we do believe that is improper. I do believe that's improper as well. So moral reasons, but also financial reasons. I do believe that this creates uh, an opportunity for abuse. I've heard the promises today of supposed safeguards, but I've got to tell you, Mr. Chairman, that I am like many Americans, we don't trust the government's ability to guard itself and its policies real well. And I hope that doesn't come as a great surprise to you. But I have deep concerns about the moral implications of this bill, also about the financial possibilities. I do encourage that this bill will be defeated and that we will see the government continue in some small form to lead corporations and society in the protection of traditional marriage. Thank you for listening to my comments, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Page. Uh, let me begin with Ambassador Guest. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service uh, to our country. I appreciate that uh, greatly. And uh, I regret that the situation existed that uh, uh, treated you in a way that you felt that you could not continue in our service because I think we have, uh, as a government, have lost out. We have, we have suffered uh, not only because of your own decision, but I'm so, sure that there are thousands of employees that have probably made the same decision over time uh, as a result of, of this policy. Let me ask you. Uh, you also, in your last few years of, of service, began to advocate on behalf of, uh, of changing the, the laws and changing the regulations as they apply to, to federal employees. <clears throat> We're looking at a, at a proposal today uh, offered by Ms. Baldwin, subject to some technical amendments uh, uh, being suggested by the Office of Personnel Management. But Basically, what they are suggesting is that in order, to, in order to extend these benefits, they will require 
uh, gay and lesbian employees to file a, a sworn affidavit under the pains and penalties of perjury that they have a, a long-term commitment, solid commitment, in some cases marriages recognized in other states, uh, and that they want the benefits that they receive as employees to be extended to their spouse, to their, their uh, domestic partners. The idea of requiring uh, employees to come up forward, you know, uh, requiring them to sign an affidavit um, in the, especially in the federal government context, can be somewhat intimidating. And I, I just want, I wonder uh, how you see that, the, the administration of that practice uh, affecting the, the utilization rate among uh, gay and lesbian employees in the federal workplace. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't think that this is an onerous requirement, to be honest. Uh, had we been speaking 20 years ago, things might have been different. But I think our society has evolved in a way where people are much more open about who they are and more honest. Honesty is a value that I think is very, very important in life. And I think most people now are much more honest. I frankly don't know that it is entirely necessary. Uh, I certainly believe that federal employees who have security clearances would never risk their security clearance uh, on the promise of a false affidavit. Uh, I don't think that people would be willing to jeopardize their employment also. But I do believe that in the interest of making sure that this process works as smoothly and effectively as possible and that there is no fraud, that having this sort of an affidavit would not be objected to by any member of the federal government that I know. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Holmes, you, you had uh, a perspective as, uh, as a parent as well as a, a partner in this. And uh, how, how has uh, your own experience, uh, I mean, over 33 years uh, going through, you know, uh, you've got a compelling story and, and it gives great power to your testimony today. Uh, how has that affected your, your uh, extended family life in, in dealing with this, uh, this policy over the years? How have uh, your children been affected by by being uh, I, I think unfairly treated by a policy that uh, that uh, obviously distinguished between heterosexual families and, and homosexual families <clears throat> well chairman Lynch <clears throat> in our case uh, my partner and I when we came together children were already grown they were young adults, so they, we were not impacted by the um, not being included or not being able to use the health benefits. But that being said, um, such an exclusion um, has a, still has a heavy impact on my colleagues. And I can share from their experiences um, in blending families and with our children, our partners. We share parenting responsibilities and love all the children without distinction. However, the federal government does not consider the children of our same-sex partners as being our children, too. I know of many same-sex couples who live in such a blended family situation, and coverage under the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program would not cover them, and is not available to the children of our partners. When the children are ill, the birth or adopted children of federal employees can be treated by a private physician. If the partner is a stay-at-home parent or for whatever reason is unassured, the partner's ill ch child sometimes must go without health care or at, must, at most turn to public services for health care. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Page, a number of the members of previous panels uh, in response uh, to questions by the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah, uh, th there was an exchange here uh, on several occasions about the idea that uh, 
as you've stated in your testimony, that uh, single heterosexual couples living together uh, were being, being discriminated against under this bill because they would not be afforded the same rights that, that gay couples would be uh, afforded as it's currently drafted. And the response from some of the witnesses, several of them, was that the heterosexual couples had the opportunity to marry and, uh, and, and, and upon that marriage, unquestionably, they would be afforded the, the benefits. Nothing, nothing, nothing further need, need to be done. Uh, and, and you've made the same, same argument that, uh, that heterosexual couples are being discriminated against. How, how, do you, how do you reconcile that fact that one couple can go ahead and get married and they get the benefits just like that and the other one, the, other, the gay couple or lesbian couple uh, can't achieve that same result? Well, I mean, I, that is a separate issue. The issue of marriage is very clear that uh, under federal law right now, they are not married and they cannot get married. So that's not even, that's a moot point to me because that is not a, even a possibility at this point as far as federal law. But what I was simply saying is this, there are many same-sex couples that simply do not choose to get married for whatever reason. There are many opposite-sex couples that choose not to get married. But there are many people, for example, who are in relationships of friendship, may even live together, elderly persons, young persons, whatever the age might be, why should they be discriminated against that they're not going to be allowed to get the same benefits that a same-sex couple would get? I'm simply saying it's discriminatory purposefully because the only protected clause in this particular piece of legislation are same-sex couples automatically discriminating against those who are opposite sex. They choose not to get married. They choose not to get married. That's not my business. That's not your business. That's their business. But the government is automatically discriminating against them. But it is, it is, it is the operation of law that, that a gay couple cannot get married, even though they have a, a long-term committed relationship. I mean, that is true. And, and, and it's an operation of law that, that you know, heterosexual couples can. But we're not ma I'm not arguing that what's legal and what's not legal. I'm arguing what is discriminatory and what is not discriminatory. But, but is that is a, connected to that? Yes, sir. I agree with that. I understand. But this is a legislative body. Yes, sir. I'm a lawmaker. Yes, sir. So we've got to talk about the law. All right. Well, then let's, let's respect the law that is currently on the books that says these persons are not married. Well, the law is not a static, it's not a static entity. Uh, we're here because, you know, a very respected uh, member of the legislature has come forward with a proposal to change the law, to ex extend the benefits. And I, and I, respect, I respect your position. I, I don't... Uh, no, sir, I don't think you do, but thank you for saying that. Oh, uh, no, I, I do respect you. Uh, however, we are trying to grapple with the issue of, in, in this case, as presented by some, equal work for equal pay, uh, or equal pay for equal work. And I, I think that there is a, there's a valid case being made when you, when you do a, a comparative uh, assessment of, of how each person is treated. I think there's, there's a, a fair statement that it's drastically different for uh, Ambassador Guest in his situation versus some of my other uh, uh, heterosexual uh, employees and, and the benefits that have been afforded to them. That, 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 you know, at least from an equal protection standpoint, I think there's a fair argument that's been put, put, put forward here. Uh, let, let me just say, say this. There, there's no way I'm going to cover the whole landscape of questions that need to be asked this evening. Uh, but what I would like to do is, is to give each of you several minutes. You know, uh, if there are aspects of this uh, debate today in the three panels that have not been covered, if there are, are, are parts of this uh, debate that you'd like to emphasize or amplify or just, you know, summarize uh, that you think that, that are a message that has not been heard here today, then I, I want to give you a, a full opportunity to do that. 
Dr. Page, I'd like to afford you uh, the first three minutes. If you'd like to, uh, as I said, just uh, put some messages on, on the record uh, about your, your feelings on this and your positions on this. You're, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do recognize that I uh, rise in favor of a minority opinion. It's not very popular. It's not politically correct. Uh, but I do stand and say that the government should be in the process of encouraging the traditional marriage that has stood for many, many hundreds of years as that way that culture is best protected. And I think the government ought to be encouraging, not discouraging. And I think this act discourages. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Holmes, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I want to start with saying the government is not a religious institution. For the government, federal government to afford all employees equal treatment does not require anyone to change their values or beliefs. It requires only that the federal government honor the legal doctrine of separation of church and state. And on, on a real personal note, it has been demoralizing to go to work each day knowing that I must endure the indignity of not receiving equal pay for my equal work. The spirit of the Declaration of Independence is that all people have the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet being a lesbian and employed by the federal government has meant that I can't or haven't been allowed to exercise that basic American right for myself and my family. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Guest, you're recognized for three minutes. Mr. Chairman, the three of us who are sitting before you now are all Christians. We all are men and women of faith and belief, but we are also all Americans. America is not, as my colleague has said, a theocratic society. This country was founded on certain principles, and among them were equality, among them were fair play, fairness, and justice. And these are principles that we represent in political discourse in this body and principles that we represent abroad when we are speaking about what America stands for. And those principles are denied by the law the way it now exists. You've pointed out that law is not static, that law changes both to deal with changing times. And from this perspective, I would say it's not from changing times. It's to right wrongs. It's to right injustices. I find the argument that somehow this bill is discriminatory sheer sophistry. We would not be sitting here today having this discussion about this bill if one of two situations existed, one being that we, gay and lesbian Americans, were allowed access to marriage because all of these benefits that are attached to employment for the federal government are attached through the institution of marriage. And the second circumstance would be if the government recognized that workplace benefits and protections and fairness should not be attached through marriage that marriage should not be the fulcrum on which these benefits are, are offered, that there needs to be a principle established of equal rights for equal representation and equal service. And that's what this really is about. That's what this bill is about. And I would urge that the committee consider it in that light. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as you know, we had several hearings going on at the same time uh, today. Um, it's the way it works around here. It's not the best way, but it's the way it works. Uh, so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the record open for five days. That will also, uh, you know, based on your testimony today, it will also give the other members of this committee an opportunity to submit question, questions to you in writing. And uh, you'll have five days to return those, those questions, excuse me, those answers uh, to the committee if necessary. But I want to thank you each. I really do appreciate all the testimony that's been offered to this committee. I thank you for your willingness. Uh, and and it, it took courage for each of you to step forward and offer testimony to this committee under oath. 
and, and we appreciate that, and we thank you, and we bid you good evening. Thank you. Good evening. This meeting hearing is now adjourned.